This is Stephen with IT. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Just let me know when you yep. want to go live. Yeah, we're still waiting for a few people, Stephen. Okay, no problem. If you want to let us know when we're live, uh, then Kathy will kick off the meeting. We are currently live. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm Kathy Jones. I'm the Vice Chair of the Special Education Advisory Committee and I'm going to start sharing the meeting until Lorraine arrives. I'll begin with um, our land acknowledgement. The Grand Erie District School Board recognizes six nations of the Grand River and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation as the long-standing peoples of this territory. We honor, recognize, and respect these communities as well as all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who reside in the Grand Erie District School Board. We are all stewards of these lands and waters where we now gather, learn, and play, and commit to working together in the spirit of reconciliation. Um, next is a reminder that we are on live stream and on YouTube, and it's being and. Um, if you want to turn on closed captions, I believe it's under the more option in Teams. Um, roll call, Jennifer, I will leave that to you. And we next have regrets from Katie. From Katie? Katie, okay, yes. thank you. Yeah. 
Um, oh. Kathy, can I interrupt? I'm sorry. Uh, we are also had regrets from Jeff Sr. Jeff Sr., okay. Um, hopefully, Laura, Lorraine will be able to find join us soon. I'm assuming she's yes. having technological problems. Um, any additions to agendas, deletions, or approvals? Um, we have one letter to add that we are discussing, correct? And yes. we we'll add that under what section? Under correspondence, um, I1A, please. I. One eight and anything else? No, I one A. Yeah. One A. Anything else we are adding or deleting? Not that I'm aware. Okay. Unless Good anyone else has something. Yeah. All right. Then we will continue on, and we will start with our timed items. And first on the list. Sorry, is... um, Kathy. Sorry to interrupt. We just need a motion to accept the agenda oh. as amended, please. Yes, thank you. I've only done this twice, so I'm going to forget okay. a lot. So just keep <laughs> reminding me. Um, we need a motion to accept the agenda, and I can't do it this time. So, Wendy, thank you. And um, Tom has seconded it. Thank you both. Um, so we're good on that one? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we'll move forward to timed items now. And the first one is um, restorative practices in, in Grand Erie and our um, Peter. Ash, I'm my apologies if I pronounce your name wrong. And Jacqueline Boyer will be presenting that to us. So if we can turn it over to them, Jennifer. Yeah, Jackie's going to run her PowerPoint so she can take it from here. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> I'll get my screen up. Hey, okay, can everybody see that? I can only see you, Jen. If Could you put your thumb up yes. if you can see my screen? Okay, thanks. Okay, so thank you all for having me here tonight. I'm really grateful to be part of such an important committee and have a chance to present what we're doing with the School Culture and Wellbeing Department. So my name is Jacqueline Boyer, and I, I go by Jackie if you hear Jackie Boyer around. I am the School Culture and Wellbeing Lead with the Grand Dairy District School Board. And tonight I'm going to talk about three things. So we're going to talk about restorative practices. We're going to talk about the Social Justice Series. And we're going to talk about special education supports for students who have been suspended or expelled. So I'm going to go through each item one at a time, and at the end of my presentation for each item, I'll pause and we can do some questions or discussion time uh, in between instead of waiting till the end and trying to then jump in between topics. So I hope that format works. I did have a land acknowledgement uh, built in, which we covered, so I will skip forward. So restorative practices, they are a practice that through school culture and well-being, we are working with the entire system to embed this philosophy. So they are an Indigenous practice. And what happens with restorative work is that when harm happens, something has occurred that's hurt relationships. We look at how do we heal that? How do we work together to restore relationships as opposed to respond in a punitive manner? <clears throat> so restorative practices are really reflective. They provide an opportunity for everybody involved to reflect. So the person who has uh, created the harm the people who were involved in the harm, whether they were impacted, whether they were a witness. Um, it's a chance to really think about what happened and then work together for some restoring and healing. Restorative practices really work to separate the deed from the doer. And what I mean by that is sometimes when we work within a punitive framework, we're labeling that person as having done something bad. And intrinsically, that can make people feel bad about themselves, feel like perhaps that there was something that they did that is about them. So what we want to do is recognize the intrinsic worth of every single one of our learners and recognize that when we use exclusionary practices or punitive practices, 
what we can inadvertently do is build non-community for that person where that person doesn't feel connected. They don't feel accepted. And when that happens persistently, then we can start to have persistent problems with non-community. So non-community, when I say that, what I mean by that is we acknowledge that hurt people hurt people. So when somebody doesn't have a sense of acceptance or belonging, they're more vulnerable to engage in an activity that might create harm for others. So in the restorative practices at Grand Erie, we do have two types of practices that we're currently working on. So the first is more of a preventative practice. And this is work that we do in the classrooms where we do community circles. In the circles, we teach students about what does community look like? And community is about a sense of acceptance, a sense of belonging, uh, safety to display your gifts and talents, uh, safety in your identity. And then we teach them what non-community looks like. And non-community is people who feel excluded, people who don't feel safe, uh, people who don't have a sense of belonging. And then we teach students How do our friends, how do our peers, how do people act when they have a sense of community? And how do people act when they feel non-community? And we really work to have our learners understand that that environment of community that we create in our schools, in our classrooms, um, after school hours with our friends, really does create the entire culture of what we're exposed to day in and day out. And we do the class circles with the educators involved, and then they can take away that language. So we're providing a culture, a philosophy, and a language to use to help students understand why it's really important that we're in relationship with each other. So the second is uh, formal circles. So when harm has happened, we can do a process called a formal circle, (laughs) excuse me, which is a process we can use to help heal the harm. And I was at a a mental health uh, training today and there was a quote that was used and I I wrote it down because I really, really liked it. And I feel it applies to restorative practices. But what it was, it was moving discipline from transactional to transformational. And when I think about restorative practices at Grand Erie, that is the goal of what we're doing. And so when we move into this topic of formal circles, what happens is we ask a set group of questions. So each formal circle has a pretty similar uh, framework that we work through. Right now, I'm just doing a high-level overview, and we'll get into some of the smaller details in a minute. But what we would do is, for the person who's created the harm, we would ask them the following questions. So we would ask, what happened? What were you thinking about at the time of the incident? What have you thought about since the incident? Who do you think has been affected by your actions? And how have they been affected? In these questions, you'll notice we're not saying, what did you do? We're also not asking why. Because when we work in restorative practices, we're coming from the understanding that we already know why. Somebody wasn't feeling community and their behavior reflected that. And so we don't need to ask why. This isn't about shame. Then what we would do is we would ask the person or persons who have been harmed, the following questions. What was your reaction at the time? How do you feel about what happened? What has been the hardest thing for you? And how did your family and friends react when they heard about the incident? And we do this separately, and this is called pre-work, and we're gonna get to that in a minute. And then what happens is we bring the individuals together and they get to hear each other's experiences and what happened. So both parties at the end will weigh in on what they feel needs to happen to make things better. How do we heal the harm that's occurred? And relationships are at the heart of restorative approach. 
Restorative practices expect that everybody's accountable for the common good with the understanding that we may repeat what we do not repair. So when we talk about training, it's really, really important when we start to move to embed this philosophy that we're offering training because it is a skill set that's used um, to have these questions in a way that really work to repair harm and to make sure that we're not creating further harm or stress as we're working through our restorative practices. So we have developed a collaboration with a community partner, uh, Garth Bell, who is somebody who I would say is an expert at restorative practices. Um, Garth is a Black Indigenous man and uh, really works in the field of equity and bringing in uh, the understanding that restorative practices are an Indigenous approach. And Garth has worked to help train our staff. Um, he's trained our administrators at the Great Conference this year. And we also have a mental health support staff uh, with the Grand Erie School Board, who is a restorative practices trainer as well. So we have folks who are working in the system to get the rest of our staff um, trained. It is a process and it is really important that folks have mentoring when they're doing restorative practices. So we're using an I do, we do, you do model. So we're not giving folks those questions and asking them to go do formal circles. We've done one generalized training and on April 8th, we'll be doing the second level training, which will be getting more into uh, the process of formal circles. And this is gonna be with all of our mental health support staff and some of our specialized services staff on April 8th. Um, we had a, a one first level training with all our school culture and wellbeing champions in March. Um, and so we're continuing to bolster the system capacity think restoratively. So Garth has trained six full schools, so their entire staff, and we're continuing to support that work as we go. We do have an Indigenous education department who uh, every day, this is their way of being and knowing, and we do consult with them as well when we're walking into restorative work and completing restorative practices for their uh, collaboration. So, Part of the scaffolding of training restorative practices is that we really need to train the why. Why is restorative practices so important? And so we talk about how hurt people hurt people, but we really need to focus on shifting uh, disciplinary practices from punitive to non-exclusionary practices. And so the second part of April 8th is going to be a system-wide training on trauma-informed uh, disciplinary practices and restorative practices will be a large focus of that training. So pre-work. So this is a part of the restorative practice that doesn't always get the spotlight, but is actually really at the heart of all restorative practices. So in order to make sure that any restorative practices are successful, we have to do the pre-work. And this is where a lot of the staff training is focusing on. And what I mean by pre-work is we have to meet with the people who are going to be involved in the circle before the circle happens. We need to interview them. We need to ask those five questions and we need to know how to dig deeper. So if there's somebody who's uh, potentially going to be involved in a restorative circle, but they're not in a good mind to heal the harm, sometimes we have to do a bit of unpacking. Sometimes we have to do a bit of unlearning. We also have to be trained well enough that we know when now is not a good time to do a restorative circle, and we need to do some more extensive pre-work. I do think that every situation can get to a point where it's time for a restorative, but some require more pre-work than others. So part of this is the understanding that when we do restorative, it's not as immediate 
as a punitive consequence. So an act of harm may occur, something may happen, and it may take a week or two before we could actually get to a formal circle because we have to do the pre-work, which takes time. When we start to embed restorative practices as a philosophy, it's in our conversation. It's in our way of being. It's in our way of relating with each other. It's in our understanding that belonging and acceptance is at the heart of safe and healthy schools. So these practices should be embedded in everyday work. But when we move into completing a formal circle, parental consent is required for that as well. So no child in the board would ever be involved in a formal circle that involves the pre-work and sitting down with the questions um, with the two parties of someone who has harmed and folks who have been harmed and um, participate in that without parental knowledge. And sometimes, depending on what's happened, parents may be involved, involved in that process and part of that circle. So prevention. So restorative practices um, really is about the message of prevention as well. It's not just about what do we do when we need a formal circle. So it's knowing that we need to meet our learners where they're at with kindness and love and this has been at the core of our messaging all year in regards to restorative practices. We need to foster safe spaces that create belonging for all. And this is our absolute best behavior management strategy. Um, we need to learn to identify trauma and so that we can work to create um, relaxing safe spaces for all. And we have been doing training specifically around trauma-informed classrooms across the system. So this was another training that was offered at GRADE, and we have been offering it for full school staff training as well. Um, our teacher consultants and our coaches, as well as our mental health support staff have all received that training. And embedded in the trauma-informed classroom training is also the understanding that developmental and relational trauma occurs for our learners with special education needs when interacting with systems that don't have the supports to uh, have them feel accepted, belonging, have their needs met. So it's relationships, not programming, that support children. Young people thrive when adults build caring relationships and when they have a sense of belonging in a safe and caring community. And this is at the heart of why we're bringing restorative practices in as a philosophy at Grand Erie. So I'm going to take a break now and open ourselves up for some questions and discussion. And I'm going to stop sharing this so I can see faces. Thank you, Jackie. Um, yes, we have questions. We'll start with Wendy. I think she was first. One question, please, Wendy. <laughs> One okay, question. <laughs> best. Okay. Um, Jackie, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I have to preface this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Kathy. I have a two part question. I hope that that's going to be okay. But, and it's more of a comment really than anything else. But um, just by way of background, I did my LLM in alternative dispute resolution, focusing on restorative justice, um, largely with uh, the idea that um, restorative justice practices really have a place in, the, in our criminal justice system. Um, but it's another one of those areas where knowledge is power. And one of the things that you touched on with respect to uh, uh, Community buy-in or parental buy-in, I think, is is really difficult uh, when you're first starting out with with this type of thing. Um, so, I guess my question is, and I think you'll probably answer this a little bit in the next session about the social justice uh, course that you're doing. But I'm wondering if, as the board becomes skilled, more skilled, and more trained in restorative justice practices. Is there a way to take this into classrooms that aren't requiring a circle, 
but as sort of a demonstration uh, to teach kids about restorative justice so that they know that if something happens to them, <laughs> you know, in their lifetime, um, that that's something that they could actually turn to themselves in their communities as well. Um, because without that broader understanding, like we are very, very much based in the idea of a punitive slash retributive um, criminal justice system. And that permeates everything. That permeates the way we parent, that permeates our schools. It, 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 it's a, a an overarching umbrella on the way that we think about learning and discipline, right? But restorative justice, as you know, has so much more to offer as far as correcting behavior, if we're looking towards correcting behavior. And that kind of touches on something that you said as well, Jackie, that is a question that I had in my mind the whole time I was studying about this area. And that is the idea that restorative justice, if you look at the name, we, we aren't necessarily wanting to restore the relationships to where they were, because that's what was problematic. We are looking to transform. We are looking to make things better, more inclusive, more understanding, more equity. But the way we do that is we have to teach. And I think that we have to teach it to our kids because I think it's going to be too late when something happens in the school and you've got a situation that is perfect for restorative justice, but you're going to get the consent from parents and they say, are you kidding? No way. I think you know, parents should be included in the process. They should be part of the circle, but they need to understand the process. And you know what? Maybe we're going to be a little bit late with this particular generation, but let's teach the next generation because it's it's a really, really um, underused uh, tool. So that's my two cents. Sorry, Kathy. Jackie, I see Peter's going to say it up too. Do either one of you have a response? Sure, I'll jump into this one because this this is a little, it's a a little a little broader, um, and I appreciate the question. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and it it actually your question, uh, Wendy speaks very much to, um, it speaks very much to the the approach that we're taking, because as we're training staff, as we're training um, on restorative practices, we also have the training through social justice that Jackie will be getting into. And our our ultimate goal is not just to teach administrators and teachers how to walk through the steps of, of restorative practice, but for the students to do it themselves. And uh, we've even seen spots uh, through anecdotal uh, evidence from some of the administrators where that has actually happened, where, where they have had incidents after students have been have been trained where they had a conflict and then were able to actually sit themselves and work themselves through the restorative practice. So it's it's very much on our minds that you're right. It, it can't be strictly reactive. We have to be kind of working in the reactive world and in the proactive world at the same time. This is a very interesting topic. Um, as you can all see, Lorraine's here. Now, Jackie, did you have more on the restorative justice or are we moving over to social justice? I was going to, when we're done questions, move to the social justice series. All right. Well, I'm going to turn this over to Lorraine since she is the chair. And thank you so much for the wonderful um, and very interesting talk on restorative justice. Thanks, Jackie. I, um, I had a lot of technical issues this evening. So um, thank you, Kathy, for taking over. Um, we're going to move on to unless are there any more questions on this uh, restorative practices or do we want to are we OK to move into the social justice series? Uh, any hands? I'm not seeing any hands, so I think we will um, uh, move on to B1B on the social justice series. And I'm not sure which one of you is going to speak on that a bit more. It's me. I'm going to okay. share my screen again. <laughs> I'll take us through three. After social justice, we're going to do um, special education support for suspension and expulsion. 
So the social justice theory, I'm just going to do a broad level highlight for anybody who wasn't here last year when the series was being um, displayed for the committee. So the social justice series was created by our CYWs and our teacher equity consultant. It's been running in select classrooms since late last school year. And it's typically been used in classrooms that have been having struggles with acceptance, equity, and belonging. Um, there's five sessions in the social justice series. Session one focuses on justice and human rights. And in this module, uh, students are taken through the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has 17 protected grounds. One of the protected grounds is disability. And this gives students a chance to reflect upon protected human rights and that when a human right is violated, it's not at the fault of the individual who has been violated. So what this section does is it really starts to open up discussion and unlearning around what is an accessible space and that disability is not the problem, but the structure or the system that is not accessible is the issue that needs to be addressed. So this section really works to empower students to see themselves and their peers as valuable individuals, worthy of dignity and respect, and to challenge systemic barriers that impede on this charter. So section two focuses on identity and belonging. This section fosters a sense of identity for our learners. It talks about intersectionality and the importance of why we discuss identity, why identity is important to everybody. So we talk about parts of our identity that are visible and parts of our identity that are 